Good morning and welcome. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today as we look into God's Word, we will be reminded of the amazing grace that He has given to all of us. He reminds us of our fallen state, but then He reminds us of how our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has raised us up, has paid the penalty, has freed us, not only for life here, but also life in eternity. Let's begin our worship with the singing of our first hymn, hymn number 380. rise. We follow the order of service, service of the word. Those of you who are here have it inserted in your service folder. Those who are worshiping with us from afar, it is on page 38 in the very front of the hymnal. We welcome those who may be worshiping with us this morning in Sitka, Petersburg, Cordova, Kodiak, Prudhoe Bay, Tuluxic, and Bethel, Alaska, Diamond Bar, California, Atoka, Oklahoma, Rodeo, Los Alamos, and Silver City, New Mexico, Ligoti, Indiana, Raymond, Mississippi, Winfield and Concordia, Kansas, and the Kirk family in Port Angeles, Washington this morning. Welcome. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. 
God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. God, the strength of all who trust in you, mercifully hear our prayers. Be gracious to us in our weakness and give us strength to keep your commandments in all we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for the scripture readings. Our Old Testament reading for this, the third Sunday of Pentecost, is recorded in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, beginning with the 8th verse. And here we not only hear of the fall of man and woman into sin, but we also hear the consequences that God imposed upon his children. We see, too, the light of hope that God gives them by letting them see a Savior that ultimately would come. And the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Here ends our Old Testament reading. Our psalm of the day is Psalm 51, and it is on page 86 in the very front of the hymnal, page 86. We will sing the psalm together. <laughs>
second lesson this morning is recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with the 13th verse. The Apostle Paul reminding everyone about what to focus on when it comes to their life in Christ. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people will cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is un unseen is eternal. Here ends our reading. Hallelujah. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Hallelujah. Respect for the Lord's Gospel. Please rise. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the third chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark, beginning with the 20th verse. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided... He cannot stand, stand, his end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Here ends our Gospel reading. Praise be to you. Oh Please be seated. We continue with the singing of our sermon hymn, hymn number 416.
Grace, pardon, and everlasting life are yours. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for our meditation this morning is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, beginning with the ninth verse. And I invite you to follow along in the Bible and the pew in which you're seated. Matthew chapter 9, beginning with the ninth verse. I will let, give you a moment or two to find that reference if you would like. Matthew chapter 9, beginning with the ninth verse. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. This is God's Word. We bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, as we hear Your Word today, send Your Holy Spirit so that these words that we meditate on with our minds are also lodged in our hearts. Bless Your Word in our hearts. For Jesus' sake we ask this. Amen. Dear friends, he had just hit the perfect drive. Straight down the fairway, about 150 yards, the ball bounced and began to roll, and it was the best drive of the day. But something was wrong, because there was a pain in his chest. He started having trouble breathing. He started sweating profusely. And the next thing you know, he's sitting down on the ground. Even though it was a perfect drive, it seemed as if he was having a heart attack. He said, don't worry about me, I'll be okay. Just give me a little bit of time. And So they helped him over to the bench and he began to sit there. And as a couple of foursomes played through, they were saying, buddy, you need to get to a hospital. Looks like you are having a heart attack. But no, no, he wasn't going to listen to that. He felt a little bit better, got up, got into the cart. They went and they picked up the balls. They headed to the parking lot. And he said, I'm not going to sit in the truck. Open up the back and I'm going to lay down there for a little. He said, whatever you do, don't take me to the hospital. Whatever you do, don't take me to the hospital. I don't know anybody who really likes to go to the hospital. But if we're sick, or if we're injured, or if we need an operation, there is no better place for us to be. Absolutely no better place for us to be. But sometimes, a person needs to know that they really need to be in the hospital in order to make it. Sometimes, even when we do know we need to go to the hospital, we still may drag our feet because we're afraid. I think sometimes people are like that when it comes to church, too. I think when it comes to going to church, there may be a certain sense of fear that's there. You might hear something that they don't want to hear. There might be a mirror that, that they're looking at that they see things they don't want to see. But someone once said the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. And I agree. You know, Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save the ones that were lost. 
He said, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Today, Jesus calls us just like He called Matthew. Come follow me. Come follow me. And maybe for us He's saying, come follow me. Come to the hospital. But return home healed for service in the kingdom. Now the incident that Matthew tells us about took place during that part of Jesus' ministry called his Galilean ministry. It was at that time that he was in northern Israel. He was performing miracles around the Sea of Galilee. And the crowds were just streaming to see Jesus. The location was a very important location. Because the city of Capernaum was situated right in the middle of regional and international trade. It sat smack dab on the trade route from Damascus and the road east that came to Damascus. And they intersected at a road or a trail that actually led all the way down to Egypt. It was a perfect spot. Ideal location for a Roman tax booth. Rome avoided running local tax booths directly. In fact, the the setup that they had for taxing was actually pretty ingenious. The Romans of the equestrian, equestrian rank would form stock companies and bid on a region, and usually they placed a bid to the Roman government for a five year period. Then, in turn, they would farm out each portion that would have a regional tax commissioner. And it seems as if Zacchaeus, the short man that Jesus met in Jericho, was a tax commissioner. He was over a very large area. Finally, there were the tax gatherers or collectors. Sometimes in the old translations they're called publicans. The local tax collectors were able to speak the local language of the empire and of the region. They had, a fairly, had to be fairly well educated in order to do this kind of job. And as Jews, they were hired to collect taxes from Jews. Once Rome received the money that had been bid for that particular area, then the middleman got whatever he wanted, and the rest was the gravy that the tax collectors had. I think one of the interesting things about this whole tax collector scheme was that it was kind of like legalized extortion. Because what the tax collectors would do would be they would value the merchandise at a much higher rate, and of course they could tax it a lot higher. And they taxed just about everything. They taxed consumable goods. They taxed durable goods. They taxed slaves. They taxed land. I think they actually even taxed the shoes that people wore. Everything was taxed. And the majority of tax collectors were very, very rich. And so it is understandable that because of their background and because of what they did, they were not liked by their fellow countrymen. In fact, the rabbis in the local synagogues would ban them from the synagogues. Being a tax collector could be a very, very lonely, yet lucrative job. And Matthew was right in the midst of it. This is the world that Matthew was living in. News had reached Capernaum about the miracles of Jesus In fact, Jesus spent quite a bit of time in Capernaum. And we do not know if Matthew was in the crowd when Jesus was teaching. We do not know if Matthew had heard about the miracles that Jesus had performed. We don't know. But what we do know is that when Jesus came and said to Matthew, follow me, that's exactly what Matthew did. He stepped up out of that tax booth and he walked away. He walked away from that form of life. Matthew's heart had been changed from a heart that beat strictly for himself to a heart now that was beating for Jesus in the work that Jesus was calling him to do. We read, as Jesus went 
On from there he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. I can't imagine the type of burden that Matthew was carrying. But if we think about it, first he was excluded from the synagogue. He couldn't go to church. He couldn't be with his fellow Jews sitting there hearing the Torah having an opportunity to enjoy the fellowship of other believers. He couldn't do that. He was an outcast among his own people. In fact, I can't imagine him having other friends that were not tax collectors because anybody who would associate with Matthew would be the type of person that people would not like because they were associating with a tax collector. And finally, I wonder if at this point in Matthew's life, all of this burden, this weight of what he was doing, how he was extorting from people, even though it was legal, all this cheating began to finally wear away at him. Was he able to sleep at night? Was he having trouble trying to sort it all out? But now here comes this man, Jesus, and perhaps he is wondering, Could he hope for a word of pardon from Jesus? Jesus says, follow me. These were words that all but guaranteed that Jesus wanted to talk to Matthew. In fact, was giving him a higher calling. Wanted him to be with him and walk along with him. A lifelong call to service in Jesus' kingdom. The cost of discipleship was weighed instantly in Matthew's mind. And Matthew got up and he followed him, the scriptures tell us. He left everything to follow Jesus. It was a little bit different with him leaving all to follow Jesus. Different than, say, for example, when Jesus called upon Peter and the disciples who were fishermen to leave their nets and come and follow him because he was going to make them fishers of men. Because the type of work that Peter and his disciples were doing was honorable work. But not Matthew. Matthew's type of work was disdained, was looked down upon. But he got up and he followed Jesus. He left it all. And what a change there was in his life. We read, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Who can understand the depth, the reach of God's mercy for all people? For everyone. Here was the worst of the worst, the least of the least. And Jesus is having dinner with him. It was a totally different way that Matthew reacted to the grace of God than Martha did. You remember Martha. When Jesus came, she was knocking herself out to make sure that he had enough food and he had the right type of meal. In fact, she got upset with Mary because Mary was sitting listening to Jesus' words. How does Matthew view the call of Jesus in the way that it would impact him? First thing that he does is he wants to put Jesus to work. He invites Jesus to dinner, but then along with Jesus, he invites all of his tax collector friends because he wants them to hear what Jesus has to say. He wants them to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen because what Jesus had said had touched his heart so that he was willing to leave and ready to leave the work that he was doing because of what Jesus was saying. Come follow me, Jesus said. And he left. When Jesus was there, he was speaking with those people who weren't just the outcasts of society, who weren't just the quote-unquote sinners. They were looked upon as being social reprobates. And anyone who associated them were guilty because of association. Jesus shows us that there may be times when it is necessary for us 
to associate with quote-unquote sinners, if you will. Even though we all know we all fall short of the glory of God, we all are sinners. As the name Pharisee indicated, the Pharisees thought that they were so much better than everyone else. And so when they talked to Jesus' disciples, the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? I think what they were really saying was they were judging Jesus by who he associated with. A clear implication that is you can determine the credibility of your teacher by the company that he keeps. I appreciate Jesus' answer when Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus, Jesus is the great physician of body and soul. And if we were to catalog the, the miracles that he performed in the New Testament and the Gospels, we would see that there were many times when he just healed people of their diseases. He healed the blind, those who were deaf. He raised the dead. He took care of physical needs by providing food for the 5,000 but he also, and more importantly, dealt with the spiritual problems that that they had. As a doctor, he could see into the heart. He could know that they needed the forgiveness that only he could give. Jesus said, as he quoted an Old Testament prophet, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. The Pharisees thought that the sacrifices at Jerusalem in the temple paid their way. Pharisees were the ones, too, who pointed to the fact that they could draw their ancestry back, all the way back to Abraham. They didn't need anything else, they felt, to be right in God's eyes. But Jesus peels that all back when he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And that really is the heart of the gospel Hosea spoke those words to Old Testament Israel to call them to repentance to escape the wrath of God. He told his people that they would go back to his place, God's place, until they would admit their guilt and come to repentance. We see ourselves this morning in the wake of not only watching Jesus be crucified on the cross, but also being there with the women on that Easter morning and viewing the empty tomb or that first Easter evening watching through the eyes of faith as Jesus appeared to His disciples and said, it is Me. I'm not a ghost. And so we too can say, I believe that I cannot by my own thinking or choosing believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the Gospel, enlightened me with His gifts, sanctified and keeps me in the true faith. I believe I can't believe. That's really the language of repentance. As we admit that we are tax collectors and sinners with no merit or righteousness on our own. We're not like the Pharisees. Because we kneel at the Lord's altar and we say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We Christians have the opportunity to talk and eat with Christ on a regular basis. We call it word and sacrament. And the focus point, there's actually two focus points in a service. The one is when we focus on the gospel. The point of the liturgy of the word really is to bring us to that point of the gospel where we hear the words of Jesus, and we focus on His love for us. But then the other focus point of the liturgy of the sacrament are the words of institution where Jesus says, this is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. They're really the highlight as God comes to us who are sinners, quote-unquote, 
but sinners whose hearts have been changed by the working of the Holy Spirit. And as Jesus is talking to Matthew, he reminds us that the church really is a hospital for the terminally ill. That sin that is in us needs to be taken care of. It needs to be taken out of us. It needs to be washed out and cleansed. And the only way that can happen is by the doctor, the physician, Jesus, doing that. Because not only does he wash the sin away, but he gives us the heart transplant, the heart surgery that spiritually we all need. And he gives it to us for free. I think there are a lot of people today that think the church is just simply a collection of people. But the word from this section of the Gospel reminds us that the church is a hospital which is only needed by the spiritually sick. It's not a museum for saints. It is a hospital for sinners. You know, the story I told you at the beginning of the sermon was about my dad. He did not want my mom to take him to the hospital, even though he had suffered this on the golf course. My mom started the truck up, started driving down the road, and remembered that there was a fire station along the way. She stopped, rang the doorbell. She didn't take him to the hospital. (laughs) The EMS did. And in that sense, His life was saved at that point in time. Yeah, he was upset. He was not happy. But he needed to be in the hospital in order to be saved. Today, we're in the hospital. We're here because we've got heart trouble. We've got sin. But listen to the words of the physician. He says, go in peace, your sins are forgiven. What a blessing it is for us to know that we too can follow Jesus to the hospital and He will save us as He has. He will save us for service. He will save us for eternal life. And that is what He's done. And with the psalm writer today, we can say, praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul. But forget not all His benefits. He forgives all my sins. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess the faith that God has given us according to the words of the Apostles' Creed on page 41. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We continue our worship as we bring our offerings to the Lord.
Please rise for prayer. Father, for giving us life and breath, talent and energy, we thank you. For income and nourishment, for honest work and opportunities to be useful, we look gratefully to you as our provider. For safety in our travels, we rejoice in the protection your angels give. For national peace, public prosperity, and moral consciousness in all citizens, hear our prayers. Lord Jesus, through you we have the full rights of children of God. What love the Father has lavished on us through our relationship with you. We praise you for saving us and giving your life as a ransom for our sin. May our spirits revive in the rest and peace of your forgiveness. Holy Spirit, through word and sacrament, restore to us the joy of your salvation. Cause the good seed of the word to produce sturdy faith and godly attitudes and behavior in each believer. We rejoice this day in the fellowship we enjoy in our congregation and our synod. Keep our parish and synodical leaders faithful to their tasks. Make them men of both courage and prayer. Preserve Christ-centered doctrine and practice in our fellowship at all times. Make each of us active in Christian service and supportive of our leaders. Open our eyes to see the spiritual dangers facing those who do not yet trust in you as Savior and Lord. Move us to share with them the hope of an ending life we have in you. Go with us into our world. Support us in all we do to your glory. Amen. We offer special prayers this morning. Uh, first of all, a prayer for Bob uh, Godwin's mother, Billy Howard, who is in the hospital. And then we also pray uh, for Deb's, Deb Seaman's niece and her husband, um, who welcomed uh, Silas Mason two weeks early on June 6th. Mother and son are home. Both are doing well. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you are the great physician of soul and body. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy on this servant of yours in her illness. If it is your will, spare her life and restore her strength. You gave your son to bear our infirmities and sicknesses. Deal compassionately with your servant and bless the medical means employed on her behalf with your healing power. We commit her to your gracious mercy and protection. For you are a faithful and merciful God. Amen. We also offer this prayer. Lord of life, we marvel again at the wonderful way in which you bring children into the world. Accept our thanks for holding your protecting hand over this mother in childbirth and for bringing joy to these parents with the gift of a child. Bless this child. Receive this child into your family through the sacrament of holy baptism and protect this child from every danger of body and soul. Give the parents the love, wisdom, and means to care for this child that you have entrusted to them. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the friend of children, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his love and give you his peace. Please be seated for our final hymn, hymn number 331. Special welcome to our newcomers, visitors. We're happy to have you worshiping with us, and we invite you to share a cup of coffee and some refreshments immediately following the service, uh, not only in the narthex, but also outside. Another gorgeous Sunday morning. So please join us for that. And if you haven't signed our guest book, uh, please do so. It is to the right of the coffee. A couple of announcements this morning. First of all, a reminder that there is Bible study on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., uh, Thursday evening, the building committee will meet with the contractor at 6 p.m. It sounds like uh, we are just waiting for the final permit to be issued. Uh, the contractor is probably going to start putting some barriers outside. Um, I'd like for us to be able to um, set a date when we can have groundbreaking, um, and that would be right following a, a service on, on uh, a, a Sunday to come. So I know Randy and I have talked about it before. Uh, so that will be happening soon. Um, also on Thursday evening, community council meets from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Um, other announcements? Matt? Okay. All right. Take, taking off for the summer? Or? Uh, at least this at least, month. At least June. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, thank you for the beautiful music today. God's blessings to you this week.